Hey guys, I'm Cole Beeler from IU Health University Hospital, and we'll be discussing the planned withdrawal of contact isolation from the MRSA VRE boogeyman. Starting on April 8th, your patients who are in isolation for MRSA and VRE will be switched from contact isolation to standard precautions. And you might be in one camp that says, oh crap, now that stuff is going to be everywhere and I'm going to take it home to my kids. Or you might be in another camp that says, this is great. Now I can be lazy and just phase in and out of patients' rooms like it was the 1800s with nary a care in the world. But let me tell you, you're both wrong, and I'll explain why. But first, some context. So Shea and CDC issued guidance on contact isolation for MRSA and VRE in 2003 and 2007, respectively. Their recommendations at the time were based on trials showing benefit of gowns and gloves in the setting of hospital-based outbreaks and was largely a fear response given the relative rarity of infection with these organisms. But things change. MRSA and VRE are no longer rare and restricted to hospital-acquired environments. And indeed, the outpatient and inpatient clades have merged together. I mean, there's a lot that has changed from 2003 until today. You can certainly take it from me. And multiple studies have shown that removal of contact isolation for MRSA and VRE has not resulted in increased harm as it relates to spread of infections if coupled with appropriate horizontal measures like hand hygiene, standard precautions, environmental cleaning, and patient hygiene. And contact isolation isn't benign. Studies have found that patients in isolation are more prone to adverse events like falls, pressure ulcers, depression, anxiety, and stress that likely relates to less frequent provider visits and results in lower patient satisfaction scores. Additionally, we know that the more patients we have in contact isolation, the less likely we are to comply with that contact isolation and hand hygiene requisites. So by adding unneeded and unproven complexity, we may be doing harm to our patients by reducing the probability that providers will be adequately protecting patients with evidence-based interventions like hand hygiene. So we have to weigh the risks and the benefits of withdrawal from contact isolation for MRSA and VRE. Cessation of isolation for these organisms has not been demonstrated to be harmful in multi-center studies, and most centers with healthy infection prevention programs are already taking this leap. Data in favor of contact isolation is old and based on outbreak scenarios. Even though gowns and gloves may add an extra layer of protection to those who are not adherent with horizontal measures, like hand hygiene, the studies actually show that making people do more things in order to get into the room to see their patients actually yields worse care with potential harm as it relates to less frequent visits and less adherence to hand hygiene, something that we know works. We feel the burden of evidence is powerfully in favor of discontinuation of contact isolation for these organisms, but we're going to need your help moving forward. The best way we can protect our patients during this transition is to make sure our ship is as seaworthy as possible by plugging all the potential leaks that could lead to pathogen breakthrough. Standard precautions doesn't mean being able to walk in and out of a patient room willy-nilly and is anything but standard. So instead of focusing on who can come out of isolation, infection prevention will be shifting focus to these foundations of harm prevention while watching hospital-acquired infection rates and hospital-acquired MRSA rates. You can refer to your local policies for details on the specific uh, procedures. The cornerstone of infection prevention should really be hand hygiene. Errors in hand hygiene cause 99,000 deaths and $45 billion in extra costs to the United States each year. Despite this, we still see people going in and out of patients' room with some sort of made-up, self-imposed exception to the rule. This can no longer be acceptable. We have to come together as a group and keep each other accountable. It doesn't matter who you are. We all make mistakes, and we all deserve to be accountable to correction. It is always appropriate to approach someone and ask them to wash their hands again, even if you're not sure if they did it in the first place. Their response should always be, thanks, will do. Anything else is totally against our safety culture here at IU and should be escalated to the appropriate authorities. There are actually five moments of accountability to hand hygiene. This, means, uh, this may mean that scrubbing needs to be redone inside the room before procedures and after body fluid exposure. If you just touch their leaking wound, probably should wash your hands again before you do the rest of the exam. After you touch your patient and before you touch anything else in the room, you should probably wash your hands to prevent transmission of infected material to the objects in the patient's room. Lastly, no matter what you're doing in your patient's room, delivering food, asking a question, dropping off supplies, delivering meds, whatever, hand hygiene should be completed before and after you breach the threshold to the room. There are no exceptions to this. IU has an anonymous hand hygiene observer program to improve adherence, and there are point people 
at each facility to handle questions and assure the system is running appropriately. Gowns and gloves aren't going away completely. In addition to non-MRSA VRE reasons to require contact isolation, we need to continue to encourage the use of gowns and gloves, even masks, in certain special situations. Gloves should be worn even if the patient isn't in contact isolation when addressing a patient's wound, starting or removing an IV, cleaning up patient body fluids, performing patient care activities like patient peri care and mouth care, and carrying contaminated items. Gowns should be worn even if the patient isn't in contact isolation when handling contaminated items, chasing, changing dressings on open, uncontained wounds, and bathing a patient who needs complete assistance. Protect your face if you're going to be generating an aerosol, regardless of if the patient is in droplet isolation or contact isolation. This is just common sense. If it's going to be cold outside, you wear a coat. If it looks like rain, you bring an umbrella. If your patient has a disgusting draining wound, perhaps consider not rolling the evolutionary dice and put on gowns and gloves. Since shared equipment can also transmit infection, all team members need to know how to clean equipment correctly. Any equipment that is not dedicated to the patient should be cleaned after use. Instructions on how to do so can be found on one source and are based on the manufacturer's instructions. Disinfectant guidance is present on the label, but please remove visible soiling on the device you're intending to clean prior to use. Every location should have a service level agreement with EVS so everyone is clear on who cleans what equipment. And an equipment should be clean, clearly labeled if clean or dirty. Another evidence-based layer of protection in our armamentarium is CHG bathing, which has been shown to reduce the chance of MDRO and VRE acquisition, reduce CLABSI, and obviate the need for contact isolation. Units are expected to do daily bathing, and CHG should be strongly considered, but ultimately, use of this product should be determined locally. Even the mechanical process of cleaning the skin is likely beneficial, but data very much supports CHG in my opinion. Remember to tell your patients that CHG is a treatment and refusal should be escalated to the doctor caring for the patient or infection prevention in order to help investigate solutions with the patient. I think this is one of the strongest tools we have to reduce MDRO acquisition and success of this withdrawal process will be based on focus on CHG documentation. So make sure to do everything you can to document your adherence to this process on daily bathing. So who's afraid of the big bad MRSA VRE wolf? Me. Uh, I'm afraid. Nowhere in this presentation did I imply that MRSA and VRE aren't serious life-threatening pathogens that can be transmitted in a hospital environment. They, they are. But when faced with something this concerning, I'd rather build my house on the evidence-based brick and mortar of hand hygiene and routine bathing than on the slipshod, slap-together fear response of over-exuberant gowning and gloving. As we transition away from contact isolation for these organisms, we need your help to augment the tried and true practices that I discussed in order to keep our patients safe. Thanks for listening. Email me with questions and follow me on Twitter.